Hi guys. Good Lord, do we have a windy day. It is a windy spring day in the collapse of global industrial civilization. And <coughs> so it looks like we have a small armada of power company trucks amassing at the border here in the great state of Texas. And uh, I guess we're going to have our power turned off uh, all day tomorrow, but I might talk about that here in a minute, but right now, before I lose my power, uh, <laughs> as the collapse unfolds in Texas, just doing, you know, my daily romp through, uh, <clears throat> I guess my daily romp through what? It is the new, uh, I, I guess this is the dawn of the age of apocaloptimism just going wild everywhere. Apocaloptimist gone wild uh, here all over. I, I just so uh, I couldn't decide which of the three of these to uh, center on. So we're just going to do a little apocaloptimist mashup while I wait around here for the collapse of global industrial civilization here. All right, we're going to go over here to medium.com. We're going to hear from someone I have never heard of before. Lauren Duntaman. Lauren Duntaman. Uh, I guess Lauren is a 20-something. Yeah, a 20-something who is studying and now is employed in some sort of sustainability uh, program. Uh, some, some, some job making the world a more sustainable place. And Lauren is remembering back to the fall of 2020 during my graduate program in sustainable food systems which tied together my love for agriculture and passion for stewarding our beautiful earth. Despite this confluence of interest, the whole program had been emotionally draining. I had found working in the environmental sector to be overwhelming because of the insurmountable task of addressing the numerous ways that the world was falling apart. By choosing to focus on both the ecological and social impacts of environmental change related to industrial agriculture, I was heartbroken as my eyes were increasingly opened to the exploitation and degradation of communities and ecosystems. Yes. Not only was I feeling overwhelmed by climate change and biodiversity collapse, but I was also daunted by what that implied. Yes, the sustainability industry. I, I guess uh, I have. A, I guess I have misunderstood the sustainability industry. The sustainability industry. I, I love those two words right next to each other. Sustainability industry operates from a premise that human impacts are bad for this earth and that the world would be best off if humans no longer existed on it. In this argument, in order to be a steward of the earth, both personally and professionally, I believed I needed to minimize myself and decrease my impact as much as possible. Yes. In pursuit of minimizing my environmental impact, I had minimized many parts of myself, drive less, buy less, be less. I reflected on moments like when I stood in the grocery aisle for 20 minutes googling whether oat milk or soy milk was the least bad alt milk choice before giving up in overwhelm and going home 
empty-handed, all of my options had an impact that I could not stomach. Yes. In a way, I was always holding my breath as we were prompted to hear tiptoeing around to make my footprint as small as possible. Yes. Uh, my efforts toward a reduced impact often made me feel like I was swimming upstream, and it was difficult to endure the mental health toll of the recurring thought that we should not really be here. Thank you, but don't worry. Lauren apparently got over her angst. I'm not sure if Lauren is female or male, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so Lauren, I guess, um, got over it. Yes, I guess Lauren took a bunch of deep breaths and then realized if carbon dioxide can play an important role in healthy functioning ecosystems, what important role can humans play? Yes, the exercise invited me to consider the way my impact could be a life-giving and regenerative one. Hmm. Yes, I, I like this. Uh, I've been saying this for years about how there is a sizable difference between knowing something intellectually, between knowing something intellectually and understanding it with your state of being, I call it knowledge on a cellular level. Uh, so, uh, but I guess Lauren uh, had a flip and now thinks that she or he or they uh, can have a positive impact on the planet for the first time in years, instead of feeling like a burden to the non-human living things around me, I began to see my presence, you know, my presence as a human, as a gift. Yes, humans are a gift to, not a burden, we are a gift to the non-human living things around us. What a different experience to picture my existence as one that gives life. Yes. Since moving beyond the mentality that suggests our, our you know, human existence is only detrimental, I've begun to really explore the ways that my contributions to the world make me a more joyful, whole, and self-expressed person. Yes. Uh. Uh. Let's see. I am energized by the communities that I am working within. Uh-huh. Uh. So anyway, of course, I had to leave a comment for Lauren not to bust Lauren's bubble. My comment, except for the ones who can no longer dance because humans have obliterated them off the face of the earth, and, of course, the domestic animals that now make up 97% of all mammal biomass on the planet, every single non-human earthling we share this planet with will be dancing on our collective graves when we finally, mercifully, go extinct. The sooner, the better. Next breath. 
Okay, then from there, came over to this fellow. I think I might have mentioned this fellow, Paul Abella, who calls himself a systems thinker. A systems thinker. And he is asking the question, do we need Armageddon to create sustainable societies? Yes. There is a narrative that the climate crisis will lead us down one of two pathways. The road towards sustainability, where a radical social transformation is triggered so that each person's needs are met within environmental limits, <coughs> or the road towards Armageddon, where we continue full steam ahead with business as usual, which leads to some apocalyptic end of the world scenario where everyone dies. It is a crude narrative that would not be out of place in a budget sci-fi film. The reality is somewhere in the middle moving toward sustainability is going to require a level of chaos and social unrest. Yes. Currently, sustainability initiatives are defined by incremental tweaks to how we do things. It's still very much business as usual, but with companies working to provide an illusion of change, there is no desire to question underlying beliefs, ideologies, or business models because doing so would shake up the status quo. The rich establishment has little interest, I would say no interest, in doing that when it would place their power and influence at risk. This lack of desire to transform society means emissions continue to increase, wastes continue to accumulate, and biodiversity continues to be destroyed. In short, we are perpetuating the problem because the underlying behavior driving the problem continues to go unquestioned. So he, uh, he breaks this down, you know, this road to sustainability for the absolute joke it is. Uh, talking about how the mass media is certainly complicit in uh, cheering on this bright green lie that humans and global corporations in the United Nations that we are going to voluntarily figure out how to tweak the system so we can figure out a way that 8 billion or 10 billion humans going about our daily life can be sustainable. So he laughs that notion off and now he turns the other cheek. The other side of the narrative, Armageddon, is just as ridiculous a notion as believing the system creating the problem will magically transform society onto a sustainable path. We're not just going, we're, and this is his opinion that we are not just going to go from a time where everything is okay. I guess he still, I guess Paul is still considering 2023 as part of a time where everything is okay to one where suddenly balls of fire are hurtling towards the earth. That is not how the climate works. The climate is changing slowly. The climate is changing slowly, yes, 
which is one of the major reasons why it is easy for the status quo to justify business as usual. Okay, so what is Paul Abella's view of how things are going to play out over the next few years and decades? What the climate crisis will create are far more aggressive weather extremes. Those weather extremes will translate into a host of interconnected social crises. Once one occurs, it could trigger a domino effect. An example is that as the century progresses, the risk of mass global droughts increases. Global droughts will lead to crop failures that will translate into food shortages. Water scarcity will accompany those droughts, leading to many regions of the world becoming inhospitable. Hmm. So we have no sign of Armageddon yet. Just This is just kind of Armageddon light, I guess. Water scarcity and food shortages are two factors that will contribute to an estimated billion climate refugees by 2050. One in ten people living at that time. Food shortages could lead to a breakdown of cooperation in the free market as countries that usually export food become increasingly isolationist in efforts to support the needs of their own citizens. A breakdown of cooperation could lead to economic shocks and spiraling inflation with standards of living reducing dramatically. When you combine the impacts of environmental changes, they are set to increase the level of stress within national and international society, thus increasing the likelihood of many different kinds of conflict and impeding the development of cooperative solutions. In a world of scarcity, the risk of war, including nuclear war, will increase as countries seek to gain control of critical resources. Ultimately, environmental changes could cause the gradual impoverishment of societies, which could aggravate class and ethnic cleavages, undermine liberal regimes, and spawn insurgencies in conditions where it becomes increasingly difficult for governments to meet the needs of their citizens, radicalization and calls for systems change will become ever louder. Instability, mass civil unrest, and the breakdown of law and order will create conditions that are ripe for revolution and could and could provide the environmental movement with the opportunity to lead an uprising should one should one revolution succeed it could trigger an ideological earthquake that reverberates worldwide and inspires other movements to overthrow governments that will be graphically shown to be unfit for purpose. Yes, we have the ideas, technology, and know-how to restore ecosystems and develop societies that work in symbiosis with nature. There is also an army of highly motivated, driven environmentalists who are fiercely determined to create a sustainable society. But it is when the climate crisis feels like a crisis that social breakdown will create the conditions 
that are necessary to redesign sustainable societies from the ground up, I guess from the rubble up, we are hurtling into a world of uncertainty, instability, and darkness. But that is now exactly what is needed for a new dawn to break through. Only then will we have the opportunity to design sustainable societies that work for us and the natural world rather than for the tiny minority that controls the levers of power. I guess, uh, obviously, Paula Bella has never read 1984 uh, about the chance of the plebes overthrowing uh, the government in their revolution. Ain't gonna happen, Paul. Uh, what was that quote? That great quote uh, from uh, Albert Einstein uh, about I'm not sure how what weapons are going to be used in World War III, uh, but you better believe the weapons in World War IV are going to be sticks and stones. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would refer him... Uh, to the James Howard Kunstler uh, series of novels, The World Made by Hand. If you want to find, uh, if you want to see the tiny minority that is going to control the levels of power, you might want to read some James Howard Kunstler at least before Jim turned into a, uh, a foaming at the mouth right-wing, radicalized Trump tard. But uh, we're going to wind up right here in Yahoo News on the mainstream media. I guess this, this is from the South Bend Tribute, Tribune, I guess meaning South Bend, Indiana, from a fellow named John Hamilton. Don't give up in the face of of global warming's adv advance, so, you know, talking about how don't let this latest IPCC uh, report. So this is why you should not give up, <clears throat> according to John. Since humans shifted from hunting and gathering to agriculture thousands of years ago, we have attempted to simplify nature, I would say, obliterate nature off the planet, simplify nature, to eliminate what we perceived as enemies to the crops we dedicated ourselves to raise. Hmm. In that process, we fought nature's complexity by removing, to the extent we could, what we saw as weeds and pests, the latter both insect and animal, Today, as a result, in our billions, we and the domestic animals we have cultured have invaded easily half, if not more, of the Earth's livable biosphere. In terms of Earth's natural history, we humans have by far been its most successful invasive species. No reason. This is uh, this is why you should not uh, become a doomer. From 1750, when the Industrial Revolution began in one relatively small island off the coast of Europe, we have unleashed millions of years of rock sequestered carbon, both carbon dioxide and methane, into Earth's atmosphere. 1750 to 2023, 273 years, is, in geological terms, less than an eye blink of time to get some scale of what we have done and how quickly we have done it 
the amount of carbon we have spewed into the air since 1750 is likely to prove at least as damaging to life over the next few centuries as the asteroid that destroyed almost all the dinosaurs, birds not included, more than 60 million years ago. All right. Nevertheless, we must not, and we need not, give up in the face of global warming's onrushing calamity. Governments and societies across the world can yet reduce the effects of the warming we are already experiencing. Some are taking so far inadequate steps to control and remedy carbon emissions. As individuals, we need not huddle in a state of depressed dread. We can do something in our own backyards to at once soften the effects of global warming, warming and strengthen forms of life we depend on for our own existence. For we and the other mammals rely on a vast pyramid of interconnected life that supports all life. As individuals, we cannot reduce carbon emissions or save endangered species on a macro scale, but we can certainly do something on our micro scale. We definitely do not have to sit in depressed dread at the strange changes surrounding us. So there are six comments on a planet of eight billion to that story. This one from a fellow named Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty says, I think Santa Claus will save us by bringing us all gifts of green cheese mined from the moon. Anyway, guys, uh, I need to go and finish mowing the backyard with my Save the Planet uh, battery-operated electric lawnmower while I still can. I, so I'm not going to sit here and be depressed about the state of this planet. I'm going to crank up the uh, Save the Planet lawnmower and get out there uh, if I can if I can get the lawnmower out of all of this save the planet there's my save the planet domestic animal I need to get out to the backyard in the great state of Texas to save the planet and fight my depression while I still can my guys